Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Gil Payar. I'm from Wix. I'm a software architect, whatever that means. Um, in, in, in Wix, it probably means doing cool stuff, uh, incredibly cool stuff. Um, one, one sentence about Wix. Wix is this. We, we're the site that builds sites. We, we help people build websites. So we built this cool drag and drop editor uh, where you build your websites using drag and drop. Not only did we build it once, we built it three times. So once in Flash, once HTML5, and upcoming uh, a React version. So yeah, uh, we're pretty crazy. Uh, but I didn't come here to talk about Wix. Uh, I came here to talk about my vision. Uh, Douglas had a vision and had no code to show. Actually, I don't even have a vision. Um, <laughs> see, Sergey Sir Sir came to me uh, about two months and said, uh, have an idea. And, and we were discussing this idea and I, I had my team about backend and frontend and the connection between them. And, and you know, I, I wrote a title. It was uh, the perfect frontend for the perfect backend. And uh, kicked up an abstract and I told them, do you like it? And you know, they had this committee and everything. They came back to me and said, Yes, go for it. I said, cool. And I started working on it July. Um, first of July, sorry, first of June. First of June, I set up open PowerPoint, um, put the first slide in, perfect front end for the perfect back end, sat on my uh, computer and had absolutely nothing. Um, no ideas, nothing. I, I had what is called writer's block. I said, okay. Tomorrow's tomorrow. So I went tomorrow evening, the, the evening afterwards, same thing happened. This is what happened day after day, the whole month of June. You, see, you can see my uh, The whole month of June happened. I, I had probably what is called writer's block. And you know, a week, uh, a week before, Sergey came to me and said, hey, come on, where, where's your presentation? Give, give me something, I, I need to see it. And I told him it was a secret. <laughs> I was uh, too ashamed to admit that I had nothing. Um, and, and I continued having nothing and total writer's block and I, I, you know, I became depressed, Prozac and everything. <laughs> and then yesterday, yesterday morning, I did what every atheist in my position would do. I prayed. <laughs> Because I had nothing else. I, I prayed to um, Alan Turing, I prayed to Alonzo Church, I prayed to Grace Hopper and Ada Lovelace, I prayed to uh, Kerningham and Richie. And finally, my, I said maybe money will help, I prayed to Bill Gates. And for balance, I prayed to Linus Torvalds. And, um, but still nothing. And then in the evening, a knock on the door. And I open the door, and I see this crazy old bent man from the desert, you know, the Galabia thing. He's just dirt and dust and whatnot. And he looks me in the eye and said, did you pray? I said, yes, I prayed. Well, and he pops up a flash drive, and the old crazy man from the desert don't give you manuscripts anymore, they give you flash drives. And he pops it in my eyes like this. Your prayers have been answered. I said, what? He said, yes, this is your talk for tomorrow. Uh, I, I, I had nothing to say, so I nodded and took the flash drive, and he started walking away very quickly um, for an old man from the desert. And I, I, I called to him, hey, what's your name, what's your name? And he said, Paul, my name is Paul. And please don't look at this presentation until the last moment, until you're with the audience, because if you will, it will soft. If you will look at it before, it will softly and silently vanish away. So, um, not only does Sergey have no idea what this talk is about, I have no idea what this talk is about. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, a message from the desert: old gods and you, a vision of back end and front end. Okay. And it has come to pass, 26 years after the great prophet Tim Lee invented the holy tantric markup language, and seven years after Douglas Crockford decreed the use of the equal sign to be a sin, 
three equals shall be the number, said he, that a certain software developer by the name of Paul had a vision. Paul lived in a small village in the land of the web and was a software architect there. While those around him called him an architect, he just liked to till the software soil, getting his hands dirty with codes and bugs and stuff. But he was restless, for he knew not what a software architect was. And in this land of the web, there were two tribes. The back-end tribe, who were an old and powerful tribe. <laughs> and the front-end tribe, who were a young tribe and full of energy and passion. And the back-end tribe prayed to the back-end gods, and the back-end tribe was happy. For the back-end gods rewarded their prayers with thread pulls, and message cues, and scala. <laughs> But the front end tribe was not happy, for they had no gods. And they could not pray to the back end gods, for the back end gods could only understand words like thread pools, and message cues, and scholars. They did not understand words like JavaScript, and Angular, and DOM. For they were old gods, and they did not understand this new long language of the front end tribe. And so it came to pass that the front end tribe had to publish their web application. To do this, they had to serve HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And they came to the backend tribe and they pleaded unto them, please pray to the backend gods to serve our code. For you understand words like thread pools and message queues and Scala. And ask the gods to serve our HTML and CSS and JavaScript. For we have coded the files and wanted the world to see them but we have no gods to serve them for us. We need the back-end gods to serve it for us. And the back-end tribe prayed, and the back-end gods answered, let it be so. And in their goodwill, they gave the front-end people a gift, a most wondrous gift, FTP. <laughs> for the front-end tribe would put their HTML and CSS and JavaScript in the FTP, and lo and behold, it would be seen by everybody in the world. And the front-end tribe were very happy, and all was well. If I could ask for uh, water from the backstage, please. I forgot mine there, and I am totally... <laughs> and so it came to pass after a few months that the front-end tribe was not happy. They did not like their URLs ending in .html. They wanted them to end with nothing. And they came to the back-end tribe, and they pleaded unto them. Please pray to the backend gods, for you understand words like thread pools and message queues and Scala. And ask the gods to serve our HTML without the extension. And the backend tribe prayed, and the backend gods answered, let it be so. And in their goodwill, they gave the front end people a gift, a most wondrous gift, URL rewriting. For with this gift, the front end developers could do a whole lot of stuff besides enabling URLs without extensions. But they could not use the tool directly. For to use the tool, one would have to pray to the backend gods to make changes in the secret, sacred server configuration files. <laughs> and so each time the front-end people needed to change URLs, and you change, need changes in URL rewriting, they would go to the backend tribe, and they would pray to the backend gods to change the secret, sacred server configuration files. And the backend gods would change it. And all was well in the land of the web. And in those days, Paul was sitting in his garden and contemplating ES6 modules. For those were exciting times. And everybody was smitten with ES6 modules. Tom, could you? For they were the future of JavaScript modules. And Paul was also smitten. And he read all he could about ES6 modules, and he could find nothing wrong with them, for he was smitten. But not everybody knew about ES6 modules. And so Paul left his land of code and bugs and stuff, and went unto the front-end tribes and preached about ES6 modules. And this is what he said. Behold an ES6 module, for it is a simple thing. It is a JavaScript file with functions and variables and whatnot. Thank you. And some of those functions and variables are exported. For they can be seen everywhere. 
by anybody who imports it. And he bespake even more. And whosoever wants to import this module shall just try to import and what they want to import and the name of the file. And verily it was a wonderful to behold, for up to now the front end people had to contend with ugly things like AMD and required JS. And so Paul went unto the front end tribe people and showed them this wonder. But they were not convinced. For they said, Forsooth, do the browsers understand this ES6? No, they do not. And who shall explain it to them? And Paul said unto them, Be patient. The browsers will understand this new language eventually. For the standards committee has spoken, and ES6 is fixed in stone. And Paul also said, And in the meanwhile, I will give you tools like Babel and Tracer and ESNext to transpile this for you from ES6 to ES5. Verily, you give unto them an ES6 file and they do magically change its shape to JavaScript. But the front end people were still not convinced, for they said, What if we have a module which we script source, and that module imports some modules which import more modules and so on very deeply? For the browser will go ahead and fetch each one in turn, and forsooth, the browser is very slow in this regard. For although HTTP is a holy protocol brought to us by the great prophet Lee, it is old, and it can fetch only one file at a time. And so the browser will bring our main JS, parse it, and then decide it will need to bring in the sub-module, sub a.js, and it will parse in, and it will find that it needs to bring in a sub-sub-module, sub aa.js. And it will do so for each and every one of our sub-modules. But the sun will go dark and the stars will turn to dust while we wait. And Paul said, fear not, for I give unto you the tools, Browserify and Webpack and JSPM. For those tools do a magical thing. For even though they are tools, they understand JavaScript. And they go unto your JavaScript modules and they crawl them. And they understand the imports and the relationships between them. And they bundle the code into a mega JavaScript file. And that is the only file you need to include in the HTML. And the front end tribe went away happy and used ES6 modules. And they were smitten too. But after a month, the front end people returned to Paul in his cave and said, Oh, Paul, for you have given us a great tool. And we use ES6 modules and Babel, and Browserify, but still we are not happy. And Paul asked, what are you not happy about? And they said, well, up to now we've been making fun of the backend people, for they use Scala, and they have a build step, which is long and arduous and painful, whereas we need only use the wondrous F5 key to rerun <laughs> our changed code. We just need to refresh the browser to see our code change. And now, alas, we too have a build step. And while it is not long and arduous and painful, it still makes our F5 key less wondrous. <laughs> and Paul was silent, and he felt unto the front-end people, for he liked making fun of the back-end people too. <laughs> and the people continued. Also, each time we change one small file, we have to rebuild the bundle. And this messes up caching. We change only a line or two, but our users' browsers download the mega bundle again. And it is voluminous and holds many megabytes and is slow to download. Our users say they feel that when the page finishes loading, it is, as, it is as if the sun has already gotten dark and the stars have turned to dust. Moreover, each HTML page has to import different JavaScript files. But those JavaScript files may import files that were imported in another page, so they are bundled in another mega bundle. So now we have to optimize the bundling manually using various heuristics. Verily, this is a rat's nest, and even though rats are tasty, we don't want them in our code. And Paul was silent, and Paul understood the needs of the front end developers, for even though he was <laughs> For even though he loved tilling the soil of code, bugs, and stuff, he was also a software architect. And so he went back to his cave and contemplated the problem. And lo, it was a hard problem with no solution in sight. 
and he was smitten by frustration. And smitten as he was, he went to sleep. And Paul dreamt. And when he dreamt, he dreamt of an architecture. An architecture never before heard of. In this architecture, the gods serving the bundles would be smart. When they serve a JavaScript file, they will not do so blindly. Instead, they will serve the JavaScript, parse, sorry, parse the JavaScript, understand the JavaScript and its submodules, create a bundle, and return that to the browser. It will be the server itself that does that. And because this happens in the server, the wondrous F5 key will work. No more build steps. Our front-end tribe can continue laughing at the back-end with their skull. What about the other two problems? Have we solved them? No. Bundling oops, is a niche hack, but it kills downloading, both because the same code is downloaded again and again, and because it kills caching. And so he went back to his cave and contemplated the problem. And lo, it was still a hard problem with no solution in sight. And he was still smitten by frustration. And smitten as he was, he went to sleep again. And Paul dreamt. And when he dreamt, he dreamt of a new thing, HTTP2. And he awoke, and he had no idea what the dream meant. Dream meant. But he was a learned man, so he delved deep into the spec. He already knew the inefficiencies of HTTP1 when it comes to many files. Too many connections, too many requests in serial. He learned that HTTP2 allows us to send requests and receive responses on the same connection and in parallel. So the browser requests the main.js file and reads it and figures out what the submodules are, sub A and sub B. And because HTTP is multiplexing, it can bring all of the submodules in parallel. And once it gets them in parallel, it can parse them and understand what the next set of files is, sub A, B, sub B, A, and bring them. Hmm, that's better. If I don't bundle, then at least the browser can ask for things in parallel, but the browser still waits for that file and only requests the first layer of JavaScript, and of, of the JavaScript files, modules. And there are multiple layers of files, and while all the files in a layer can be brought in parallel, each layer is brought serially. And then he learned about HTTP2 push mode, and he was smitten with its beauty. In HTTP2 push mode, a server can push the files to the browser without the browser even asking for them. So when the browser requests main.js, the server can read the JS, learn the hierarchy, and can push the whole bundle, one by one, unbundled, sorry, oopa. Yep, Sergey, time to leave. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> and can push the whole bundle one by one in parallel, unbundled, even if the browser asks for main.js. The server, because it understands JavaScript, anticipates the browser. Whoa, this solves the overbundling, he thought. Because I don't need to bundle anymore. I just need to push all the resources forward when I get a JavaScript file request. The JavaScript file in all its dependencies, even later. But what about caching? What if the browser already has these files? Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it not need them? And he learned some more, and he delved deeper into the spec, and he learned that push mode is compatible with caching. And so the browser can kill the responses in flight and say, it's okay, it's okay, don't send it, I already have it. Perfect! All our problems are solved with HTTP2. When we receive a JavaScript file, we push all the dependent files, and if they're already cached, then we don't. No more bundling. And it was thus in an excited mood Paul rushed to the backend tribe and implored them to talk to the backend gods about ES6 modules and parsing and caching. But the backend tribe did not understand these words, for they knew only words like thread pools and message queues and Scala. Please, he tried again, I beseech upon thee all that is holy. It is important to my tribe. 
This time, the back in God's answer. Oh, piss off, we give you your URL rewriting. What is this JavaScript you are talking about? What is this nonsense? Depressed and forlorn, Paul went back to the front-end tribe and told them about his tribulations with the backing gods. And there was much weeping and much wailing and much gnashing of the teeth. <coughs> and Paul returned to his cave and asked himself, what if, what if there were new gods? Gods who would understand words like JavaScript and Angular and DOM. Then if the gods understood this, then they could serve our JavaScript modules with HTTP2 push with caching. And with this thought, he went to sleep. And in his sleep, he dreamed of HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And betwixt one dream and another, he thought, hmm, can we do unto CSS what we did unto JavaScript? For it is the golden rule. For we already know that if the God, we had gods that understand JavaScript, they could give us all of this that we talked about. In CSS, could we get similar rewards? And with that thought, he woke up. But he was not a CSS expert. For CSS was an arcane science with much to be learned. But he was a learned man. And he had heard that there was a pro great prophetess of CSS, the prophetess Leah. And she was a great prophetess, for she knew all the secrets of CSS. And he read, and he learned, until finally one day he cried, Eureka! For we can do unto CSS what we do unto JavaScript. We can transpile it. We can use less and SAS and Compass so that our CSS will be better. And we can minify it. And CSS has modules. So we can do unto CSS what we do unto JavaScript. So if the gods understood CSS, we could do all these things just like it. We could use the Windows F5 key and it, can, it will be unbundled and cached better and everything. And it was thus in an exciting mood that Paul rushed to the backend tribe and implored them to talk to the backend gods about CSS modules and HTTP2 and less. But the backend tribe did not understand these words, for they knew only words like thread pools and message queues and there you go. Please, he tried again, I beseech upon all that is holy. It is important to my tribe. And again, the backend gods answered, oh, piss off. We gave you your early writing. What is the CSS you are talking about? Depressed and forlorn, Paul went back to the front end tribe and told them about his tribulations with the back end gods. And there was much weeping and much wailing and much gnashing of the teeth. And Paul returned to the guy his cave and asked himself, maybe the gods are right. And these additions do not have enough value. We need more value. We need more value from the idea that the gods could understand words like JavaScript and Angular and DOM. And Paul thought of HTML and caching. For he knew that the front end, for the front-end developers, caching is all important. And that there are two kinds of browser caching. One in which the browser checks if there is a new version on each request, using last modified and etag. And in the other, the browser always assumes that the cache is OK, using the expires header with an infinity date, an infinity cache. And they knew that the front-end type likes the second one, because it is much, much faster. And because the front-end tribe thought caching was important, and because infinity caching is the best, they did crazy things <coughs> for each release. Rename the files and modify the script source to reflect this name change. And because every change means renaming the file, they could use infinity caching on the file. But it was manual and error-prone and hackish as hell. But what if? What if the gods did these things automatically? For if the gods understood HTML, they could attach the modification file of the file to the URL and serve it from there. So it would change this. The server would change this to this while still serving main.js. And it would do this to all JavaScript modules and verily also do it unto the CSS. And so yet another speed increase in serving the pages. Is this enough value for the backend bonds? And it was thus in an excited mood that Paul rushed back to the backend tribe and implored them to talk to the backend gods. But the backend gods did not understand any words, for they knew only words like and, and, there we go, please, please, and again, the backend gods answered, oh, pissed off, we gave you your early writing. Depressed and forlorn, Paul went back to the front end tribe and told them about his tribulations with the backend gods. And this time there was not a lot of wailing and weeping and gnashing of the teeth, for the front end tribe themselves were a bit pissed off. And Paul? Paul believed he was on a mission from God's. 
a mission to understand who these new gods might be. And Paul continued thinking, and he thought more about this HTML. And he thought about how HTML was served in these days of single page applications. How do single page applications look like? First, the browser requests the HTML from the server, reads it from the file system, the server, and returns it to the browser. This HTML is bare, without any data shown. So in it, there are AJAX calls to various services in the backend, which returns a JSON, which causes the HTML to be filled with data. And so the page is viewed only after another round trip to the servers. Also, this call can be done multiple times to refresh the data or bring more or update it. But what if? What if this, we could render the HTML from the server? Then we could call the service from the server that's doing the rendering and remove the need for another additional round trip. It would look like this. First, the browser requests the HTML from the server, which reads it from the file system, but before returning it to the browser, gives it to some code, rendering code, which renders the code, calls the services in the backend, which return a JSON, which causes the HTML to be filled with data and return to the user. And so the page is viewed only after another, and so the page is not, it has only one page view and no round trip. But the browser can continue calling the service to refresh the data or bring it. But we all know that to write the rendering code on the server, you must understand the language of Scala. And the front-end people do not understand these words. Moreover, the same code needs to be written also in JavaScript, so it can be run in the browser and communicate with the services while the page is being shown to the user. The gods, sorry, but the gods cannot understand. What if the gods can not only understand JavaScript, but also execute it? Then we could use this to write the server code in JavaScript, and we would not to need to understand Scala, and we could use the same code for the front end and the back end. For it could be a wondrous thing to share code between the front end and the back end. Would all code be then written in JavaScript? Oh no, only the front end code that just happens to need to run in the backend. For the backend tribe is old and powerful and does wondrous things in the backend using stuff like thread pools and message queues and Scala. But they knew that if he would go to the backend tribe with these thing ideas, they would ignore them. He knew that. He knew that they would say, oh, piss off, we give you URL writing. What is this server-side rendering you're talking about? But what if? What if there were new gods? God would understand words like Angular and JavaScript and DOM. Then we could pray to them and be answered with things like server-side rendering. And so Paul finally understood and was smitten by a vision. He now understood that the old gods were not enough anymore and decided that maybe, maybe, maybe it was time to leave the old gods be and go and search for other, newer gods. And so he roamed the earth and he came upon the land of Node. And in the land of Node, he talked to the people, and they were friendly people, and they understood words like message queues, but they also understood JavaScript. And Paul talked unto their God, and explained in conundrum, and the God said, hey, great idea. Let it be so. You can now pray to us, for we speak in the holy language of JavaScript, as was laid down by the prophet Brendan Eich. And what you pray for, we will do. Oh, and just remember, never use the equal sign twice, for it is a sin, and the whole, as the Holy Crockford has decreed. Remember, three shall be the number. <laughs> and happily, Paul went back to the cave and prayed to the new gods to allow them to serve GSS JavaScript intelligently by transpiling the ESX, minifying the real result, serving ESX modules using HTTP caching, and who knows what else? And allow them to serve CSS intelligently by transpiling less, minifying the results, serving CSS modules using HTTP push mode with caching. Who knows what else? And allow them to serve HTML intelligently by rewriting resources for infinity expiring, render HTML using server-side JavaScript code, and cache resources using HTTP push mode with caching. And who knows what else? Oh, the front-end drive. The front-end tribe were a young tribe now, but full of energy and passion. They were happy at last. For now, they need not pray to the old gods, who only understood words like thread pools and message queues and Scala. They could now pray to the new gods, and who would understand words like JavaScript 
and Circe and Angular and Don. Thank you. The end.